technology. And it's just our privilege to be sons and daughters of God coming together on the Sabbath to worship together. No matter how we do it, we're here in God's house to give him honor and glory this morning. Uh, I'll run a, I think what we'll do is let's take a few minutes for prayer and praise. Then I'll bring you your announcements and then the protocol for the remainder of the day while we're in this building so that we're all on the same page. And then we'll have our mission spotlight and then we'll enter right into our worship hour. So we've got a little piece of time here, about 10 minutes. We want to start promptly at 11 o'clock. So I'll open it up. Does someone have a, a praise that they would like to share this morning? And, and if you bring it, just speak in an, in an evangelistic voice so that those who aren't present with us physically this morning can hear your praise and prayer requests. We want to keep them brief, but we'll take a few minutes. It's appropriate for us to do this. We do it every Sabbath here at Dixfield. So a praise. Does someone have a, a praise that they would like to share this morning? Grace. Amen. You'll see on the pews, there's a little green marker. Those are pews that you can sit in. We want to keep our social distancing this morning. So if there's a green marker on the end of the pew, that's a good one to sit in. Another praise. Someone have a praise. Amen. Thank you, Sheila. It's really awesome to be there. And as we learned in Sabbath school, to trust God. He's got it under control. Very good. How about another praise? Jerry, you have a praise. Me? Yes. Well, well you know, there's always, you know, I'm always so thankful for God's grace and mercy towards us each and every day. And I see that even in times, you know, like yesterday morning I was going through, I was like, you know, we're coming here today and listening, and, you know, gets that repurposing back, and you just want to go forward. So I want to praise God because he doesn't leave us. Amen. He's there with us through whatever we're going Amen. through. And Amen. And strengthen us to stand Amen. and not run the other way. Very good. Praise the Lord. How about, yes, Teresa. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Teresa, for your good work that you're both you and Deb have put in a lion's share of, of uh, good work. And, and probably the last three or four months are the most difficult of the school year. But praise God, and I'm thankful for, for your good work. How about a uh, prayer request? So anyone have a, a request that they'd like to bring this morning? Yes, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Very good. Mark it down. Pray for these. Pastor and then Jerry. Okay, you can start meeting together 
up to 50 people. And so there are some people in the communities where all of our churches are, they're seeing whether our church is going to open up. Because there'll be some churches that won't open up. I mean, there'll be some smaller churches that will just say, you know what, we can't do it anymore. And I, you know, during this pandemic, we were, Christians were marginalized in this country because they said that this was not an essential thing. Only essential businesses could stay open, right? If there's anything essential, yeah. it's Christianity, right? <laughs> Amen. So we got to pray that God will keep us humble, that we won't be combative with other people, we won't be demeaning, and we won't be critical. But that we'll be faithful, like Mordecai, you know, in the gate, you know, he was faithful. God is calling us to be. So I pray for grace for all of his people. Amen. Grace. Um, I want to pray up for the country with the, with the demonstrations and yes, all that man. stuff that's going on. And that's, that's, that's like another pandemic, you know. And it's just as serious as yep. the virus. And, mm -hmm. and we need, as Christians, we need to respond the way Christ would respond Amen. and not necessarily just sit back and do nothing, but we need to know what Jesus wants us to do Amen. and say. Amen. And that's going to take some prayer, I think, because people are watching us on that, too. Amen. Very good. Uh, Teresa, one, one last one, and then Jerry, and then... Okay. And Jerry? Okay, prayer request. Um, you know, the, I spent the winter away again, and you know, I'm with my children. And, you know, children have a way of pulling on your heart. You know, when you talk about standing for what you believe and purposing in your heart, I think it's harder sometimes with our family right. than it is with the stranger at the gate. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I saw a lot of times over the, the seven months I was away with my family that I am stand very strong. And, um, but I pray that God will still be working with these guys because they were all raised in the truth. <laughs> you know, they all know it. And um, I just pray that God will um, stop, that he'll put people in their path that will encourage them to keep following. And Amen. I asked for prayer too for my, my brother just passed away um, Sunday evening hmm. and his family too. Let's take a moment to pray. I'm going to pray right here at the at the podium. If you could kneel, and then we can uh, just draw an eye to God. Father, we just thank you so much. You've called us to worship this morning, but. Amen. This is your house of prayer. Amen. And it's a privilege for us to uh, send praises heavenward this morning and to bring our concerns and our requests to you as a part of our worship service. So we, we praise you for being true to your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for the Holy Scriptures and the way that you've proven yourself through history. And our desire is to be... Uh, the movement at the very end of history. Yes. And so we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to bless, guide, and direct us. We also thank you uh, for the privilege of prayer this morning. We thank you that we've gotten through this tough school year. Yes. We thank you for Teresa and her good work. We thank you for all the families and each student that is represented in our school. And we're just praying that as uh, we head into summer that uh, families and students will be revitalized and ready for action again. Amen. We thank you for our church Amen. and for preserving it and for calling us to worship today. Yes. What a privilege to come together after all these weeks of being away and at home. And we, Pastor Rick brought uh, a special request. We want to praise you for preserving both Pastor Don and Barbara Amen. through this illness that they en endured this past winter and and we pray um, that you would continue to, they're not fully back uh, in the saddle again and so we just pray that you grant them health and strength yes. 
Thank you for their ministry here. Thank you for Stephen as well and his Bible studies, all these interests that are generated and his behind, Stephen's behind the scenes work. We thank you for him and we, we praise you for, for preserving our church. Grace's request this morning is for our country and boy, we are in a mess here. You know it. And I think every, every person who lives here in America knows that just this is not right. We pray for those that are involved in the riots, for those that have been affected by the, the COVID-19 virus, and those that are being uh, marginalized and are being directly affected by the, uh, the collapse of our economy. And so we just pray today that your spirit would rest on America and on this world we know that you're preparing this place for Jesus, for his soon return. We know that the signs will be fulfilled, but we want to lift up our country today, lift up our leaders, lift up our governor, and pray that you would uh, be involved in the, every decision that is made for the place in which we live. We pray for Ron Nickerson. Uh, Teresa brought Ron's name, Pastor Ron, and we ask that you would heal him according to your grace and will. Thank you for Jerry's uh, concern for her children. We all have children, and most of us have children that have wandered from the truth. And we ask that you would put in their pathways the triggers that would remind them of where they come from and what they know of you, what they've learned from you. And so we ask for the Holy Spirit's outpouring on our children, and especially those that have turned away from you. And lastly, I'd like to remember Jerry's brother, his family, uh, and Jerry in particular, and the loss of her sibling. And we just pray that you would uh, guide and direct in those family members, that their hearts and minds would be drawn to you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for blessing us. And uh, we just want to uh, lift our praise to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Let's go ahead and watch our admission spotlight quick, and then some quick announcements, and then we'll begin our worship service. When doctors told us that he had type 2 diabetes, he didn't know exactly what to do. He was immediately put on three medications, and none of them seemed to help. Eventually, Resta visited a nearby Adventist healthcare clinic. At the clinic, they taught me how to change my lifestyle, and since then, I don't take any medications. I eat a vegan diet, and I work out a lot. Resta's health transformation inspired him to attend the Adventist University in Hungary to get certified in lifestyle consultation. Because I have diabetes, I really want to help other people with this disease. That's my motivation. Today, Resta is the coordinator of a global mission urban center of influence in Deverson, the second largest city in Hungary. This center provides a number of services, including a salt room, therapeutic massage, medical advice for asthma and lung problems, and grief and addiction counseling. From the first moment we come here, we tell them everything is based on Christianity. Our base is the Bible. The Christian care and professional services visitors receive encourage them to return for other programs. We are very lucky because God gave us six doctors who are church members, and also more than 10 members who are working in the healthcare field. I think it's a good opportunity for us to help people and work together for people. I think it's a very important place because in church, you can treat the spiritual health of people. And here, you can treat the body and give them advice about the body. I think this place is like a bridge between the people of the city and the church. This urban center of influence started through total member involvement when Anna Maria decided to open a small bookstore where people could relax, socialize, and browse faith-based books. It's for their... People don't have proper connections with each other. They're just rushing all the time. We were trying to reach out to those people who didn't have proper and pure connections with others. We wanted to pray with them and for them. Through this ministry, several people have come to know Jesus. But I heard, there's a woman who has several problems and came into the store. I was able to recommend some books and support. 
we talked, and I invited her to church. And she became a church member. It was like a miracle how much of a loving atmosphere there was. They were very kind to me. They offered for me to sit down and talk with them. I'm very thankful for the center, and I'm thankful I can share my new beliefs and love with others. Another way Advent has spread love is through their annual event called Reach Out with Flowers. Each year, one of the church members grows thousands of daffodils on his land and donates them for all the church members to give out freely in the community. Many people ask why we do this. The answer is simple. Just because we want to show love and be a blessing to people in the city. Adventists and Debreson are trying to connect with people in creative ways. Whether it's through medical services or partnering in city events, they want to be involved in the community. Please pray that their outreach efforts continue to spread the love of Jesus to the people of this large city. Thank you for supporting Global Mission, which supports projects like these in cities around the world. Amen. <clears throat> A few announcements and then the protocol for the rest of the morning, and then we'll begin our worship service. The, uh, the schedule this week, all of our meetings, our church meetings, are still going to remain virtual. In other words, we're not doing anything here until next Sabbath when we come for worship. But we have three events that are ongoing right now, and I just want to remind you of them. And if you're not aware of them, we can get the details to you. We have a midweek Bible study every week, uh, Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, our Bible worker, Stephen, is facilitating that meeting, and we're switching gears this week. We, uh, it's on Zoom, so you can go to the Zoom site, either dial in on your phone or get in on your computer. And uh, Colossians chapter 1 is the homework assignment this week, so read Colossians 1 and then tune in Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. Friday night, we began Friday night Vespers last night. We're doing Steps to Christ. Valerie led out last night, 7 o'clock Friday evening on Zoom, same way. And uh, this week will be uh, Frank Donald will be the facilitator, and you need to read Chapter 2 of Steps to Christ. Does someone know the title of Chapter 2? The Sinner's Need of Christ. Very good. So that's this week's assignment. If you have a Steps to Christ, read Chapter 2. If you don't have one, we've got some out back. We can get one in your hands, and you can tune in next Friday evening at 7 o'clock. And the last one, we're wrapping up our Great Controversy study with Dennis Farley. And that, I believe we're on the last chapter. Is that correct? Chapter 42. Anybody know what that title of that chapter is? The Controversy Ended. Very good. And what's, what time is that, Stephen? Uh, it's at 6.30. 6.30. So Wednesday, o'clock. Friday's meeting is at 7 o'clock. Sunday's meeting is at 6.30. They're all on Zoom phone or computer. If you have any questions, call Pastor or, or uh, get a hold of myself or James and we'll get you squared around. Uh, the protocol for our time together this morning, and we're going to continue to do this until the CDC uh, loosens up the regulations more, but this is kind of what we're going to go with. Yes, Teresa? Uh, yes. Okay. It's about the graduation, probably. Okay. Tuesday night, we are moving forward with our eighth grade graduation. It's not our typical graduation, where we all meet here. Um, so for the church to participate, if you want to participate in the drive-by celebration, you'll meet here by uh, 545 here in the church parking lot. And I have somebody who's going to lead the procession past the school to congratulate our students. And then after that ends, there's going to be a small service for them and their parents. So that the church and the community can be involved, you're welcome to join in that drive-by. So you'll meet right here in the parking lot. The goal is to meet here and hopefully leave at 545 to head to the school. Okay, very good. Okay, yes, this is the ground rules. 
Oh, if you didn't hear, for those of you who are listening and didn't hear Teresa, uh, the graduation is this Wednesday. If you're interested in the drive-by, they're going to be a small uh, graduation ceremony for the families of the graduates and the graduates themselves. But if you're interested in participating, we're going to meet here at 530 and do a drive-by uh, the school. We'll meet at the church parking lot and then drive by the school. And if you need any additional details, call Teresa Sweet and she'll fill you in. Here are our ground rules uh, this morning and we'll continue to use these until uh, the uh, regulations lighten up. No food. We're not going to have fellowship dinner here until uh, it's safe to do it and, and approved. So, and we're asking that you not bring any food in this facility. So no food in the facility and, uh, and no potlucks or fellowship dinner after our worship service. We're recommending that when you come in the building that you wash your hands. That's, that's uh, part of the distancing protocol. You wash your hands and you stay six feet away from anyone other than your immediate family members. It's advised that each of you have a mask. If you're closer than six feet, then you need to put your mask on. And if we don't obey the rules, then we'll all have to wear our mask while we're in here. We don't want to have to do that. So if you're greater than six feet, you're good. The pews are marked at the end. I think most of you have figured it out. At the end of each pew where there's a green tab, that's a pew that you can sit in. <clears throat> Two people per pew, one on each end, if you're not in the same family. If you're in the same family, then you can sit together. If you're a, f a family like, like some of our families here today, you can all sit in the same pew. And, uh, but if you're not, then it's, two in, it's only two people per few, pew, one on each end. We want to try to maintain the six feet social distancing within the pew. We can get approximately 35 people in the sanctuary if we get more than that, we're set up to have an overflow out back and we'll run the service on television and we'll move out back. Those of you who are who come in late or some long if what we're recommending is if you're a long standing member, we're asking you to go out back and let the the visitors or the guests stay in the sanctuary. So that's the way we're gonna run that. The water fountain is closed. If you need water, we have some bottled water here. We're advising that you bring, bring your own water with you. The offering plate will be passed by a deacon today. Our deacon will be Stephen. And so he'll just, he'll pass the plate between the pews. It's, it's convenient having a pew empty in between so he can, he can uh, collect the offering. And then the deacon who counts it will need to count the money with gloves. That's part of the protocol as well. Uh, don't touch the hymnals unless you've washed your hands. And this is, the set, this is the part that we probably dislike the most, and it was announced to us last week when we worshiped at Turner, is uh, we're not going to be able to sing until uh, that's approved. We have special music this morning, but for us as a congregation, no singing until that ban is lifted. In our facility here, after the worship service, what we're gonna do is we're gonna dismiss from the back first. So if you're in the back pew, you leave first, and then you will just file out, and no loitering in the building. If you want to socialize, the parking lot is the place to do it. So uh, leave by pew, the last people to leave this room will be those who are in the front. So we'll just exit from the back. And I think Stephen can, can facilitate that when we get to that point in our service. Any questions? That's basically, it seems like a lot of rules. And most of us are saying, we're sick of rules. We want to get back to normal. But, but we're going to abide by the CDC uh, recommendations. And we're, we just feel privileged to be able to come back into our sanctuary again this morning and to be able to worship God as a family. Amen. And uh, I just want to welcome each of you here, especially our visitors today. We're, we're thankful and privileged to have you join us Amen. here this morning. Um, I think the way we will open this this morning, Rick and I, usually the elders and the, the pastor for the day, we usually pray out back before our worship service. But we didn't do that. But I'm going to ask Rick to come up sure. and we don't need to pray alone. We can pray together that God's
Spirit will be here. And I'm going to ask Rick if you could pray for us as we begin. This will be basically our invocation. Okay. Our Father, today we praise you and thank you that you are teaching us through the experiences of our lives how to be true to you and yet loving and kind to all that we're with. Lord, this is not our natural inclination or way, but Lord, we praise you that you have called us for such a time as this to be filled with your Holy Spirit as we work to be a blessing to everyone that you bring us in contact with. Lord, we've come in faith this morning to honor you and bless you and to fellowship with our brothers and sisters with each other and to be a witness to others that those who drive by your church will see that we have taken advantage of this opportunity to meet together even though it's not as convenient or easy as it has been in the past we thank you it's our privilege and Lord we also have come we've studied your word in Sabbath school we thank you for the insights you brought out we we're going to open your word in our service today we're asking for your Holy Spirit to really not only bring conviction but transformation in our thinking and in our wills and and that this week we will be more fervent and convicted and united to you and each other than ever before we trust you lord for this that your spirit is being poured out and we've come with our cups eager for drops from heaven we thank you in jesus name amen, amen. please remain standing i'm going to read our call to worship this morning this is from Psalm chapter 27, verses 4 and 5. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, Amen. to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Amen. May the Lord bless us this morning as we worship him. Amen. Please be seated. Again, I'd like to welcome you here this morning as we've come to worship. We're very thankful in our opening. You know, it's nice to have Pastor Ball here, but it's a special blessing as well to have Pastor Rick Koontz here to be our our preacher and speaker today. So we're thankful for the way that God has provided for our, our needs, and we know that uh, we will receive a rich blessing as we worship him. It's been a long time since we've taken up our tithe, returning of our tithes and offerings. I know most of you or some of you have been returning those in the mail or in the little box here when you can get into this building or some are, are actually doing their giving online, which is good. But we have the opportunity to return our tithe and offering this morning. And I'd like to read the, uh, the reading for today. And uh, our special offering, our loose offering, is for local church budget, which is appropriate for our first Sabbath back. Max was just a young boy living in rural Virginia with his parents and his sister. One summer evening, they went for a short drive to the river to eat their picnic supper. How many of you like going out and eating supper by the river in a picnic? Oh, I love picnics. Center Hill is a nice place for a picnic too, but anyways, uh, Max went that summer evening with his parents, and they went down to the river, and soon it was time for the family to pack it up and go home. But when they arrived home, they found that the back door had been broken, and it was wide open. Someone had broken into their home and stolen many of their belongings. Some of us have experienced that as well. 
Later that night, while Max was lying in his bed trying to go to sleep, he remembered something very important. He ran into his parents' room and excitedly asked if the robber had found their church money. His parents got up and they all went into the kitchen. Sure enough, the jar full of money was still there. The family had been saving their extra coins and an occasional dollar to give as an offering on the coming Sabbath. And they were so thankful that the gifts for the church were safe. With thankful hearts, they carried the jar to church the following Sabbath and happily placed the money, the jar and all, in the offering plate. They put the whole thing into the offering plate. Let's be thankful today for the blessings that we have. You know, Carol and I, we've been thinking a lot over the last few weeks in particular, what a blessed people we are. God has been so good to us. Challenges, we face challenges, but God has been so good. And uh, so let's be thankful today for the blessings that we have and the monies that we can generously share to give support to the local church budget uh, as we return our tithe and offerings today. Stephen will wait upon us at this time. We don't have music, so I'm going to sing one. Greg's going to have the special music here in a few minutes. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me Lord to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary. I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege to return to you these tithes and offerings. Amen. Thank you for keeping us all these weeks. And uh, we're just happy to come and bring our love offerings to you today in this tithe. We pray that you would bless it, that you would prosper your work in the whole world as well. And we ask that... Uh, that through our response today that you would create in us work, the Sabbath work of creating in us a transformed life and a new heart. Thank you so much for being here, God. Please bless us is our prayer. And bless these offerings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have some children. Unfortunately, you're going to have to stay in your pew this morning. But uh, we have our children's storyteller, Penny Dennison, and I'm glad that uh, we have something for the little ones today. Good morning. I've been up since 2.30. I got up and hiked a mountain this morning. Amen before the rain came. So good morning, kids. I am so glad you're here. You know why? I thought I was going to be talking to all the old folks. (laughs) So my Bible verse this morning is from Psalm 42.1. And it's hard for me not to sing this, because that's not the way it's written in the Bible. As the deer long for you, so I long for you, O God. So, like if I walked by you and I handed you a dollar bill, like maybe you were, here's a dollar, what do you think you'd like to do with your dollar? Anybody got an idea? You can speak. A dog, yep. Anybody else have an idea? I was on a 
about hmm, eight years ago, I'd say. And we met with the people of Chomi. Chomi is a mountaintop village in Tanzania on the east coast of Africa. Tanzania also happens to be the home of Africa's highest peak, Kilimanjaro, which happens to be on my bucket list. We brought medical supplies, doctors, a dentist, and evangelists. And after the day of health clinics, we would worship with the people of Chomi. Now, it was very interesting how we got to Chomi. We all piled on this big bus, and we bought that was carved into the side of the mountain. And it was a sheer drop. It was rather terrifying. So when we, wow, uh, the first Sabbath came along, and we got back on the bus and bumbled back down the mountain, just halfway. And we had plans of worshiping there with that village. We bringing our worship team down, but we were all the worship team. One of the joys of the bumbling bus ride up and down the mountain was that children would come running out to meet it as we passed by so that the inhabitants of the bus could toss them brightly colored pieces of candy. They'd scramble for the raining treats to our great joy and amusement. The day we were down in that village, it was so hot. Shade was at a premium. Everybody wanted to be under the trees. I found myself inside a clay-covered home for Sabbath school, which was luxurious. I had long run out of candy to share, and there remained plenty of children at our feet. One little fella, I see one, well, I guess there's, how many little boys we got back there? One, two, three, four, is that four? Um, my li the little boy in my story is about eight years old. Is anybody eight years old? Close. Well, they, um, one little fella got near me and nudged my heart for what they call a jifty. Means you brought him a gift. They'd say jifty. Without a treat, I gave him what I had, a Tanzanian shilling, and off he ran. I got a stern rebuke for giving a child money because people were afraid that I would be mobbed by all the children once the word got out. I kept my eye on him when he came. The next time I saw him, he was surrounded by other children presumably wandering after the treasure he had traded it for. Guilt began to settle in my chest, worried I had instigated shopping for candy on the Sabbath. But as the boy emerged from the crowd wearing a permagrin, he presented with his treasure. A fresh bottle of water. I wonder how many of us have cool water as we would be, say, a whoopie pie. <laughs> We've been talking in the old folk reveals the love of God, how trees give us leaves for shade in the summer, yet sheds them in the time to let the sun's, sun's warmth come into the trail to cool during the during the cool months anyway <laughs> how the vastness of heaven declare God's vastness how the rock solid mountain tells you God is solid and does not change how the quiet peace and mysteries of space hint at God's peace 
how the tiniest detail of the tiniest butterfly reminds us that God cares about our every little thing too. And God found a way for that little boy to get a refreshing drink of water. You can go back. Oh, I can go back. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Penny. Yeah. What an awesome worship service this is. Yeah. I am just really just loving this service this morning. So now it's time for our scripture reading. I'll share that with you. And then we're going to hand it over to Pastor Rick Koontz, and he will bring us our message for the day. But before that, Greg will have our special music. So I'll read the scripture. Greg will sing. Rick will preach. Our scripture reading is Acts chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. And this was when Peter, with his friend John, were preaching in, on the portico of the temple. And they were, remember, they were told to be quiet. But these are the words of Peter. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who is preached to you before May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. This hymn has uh, struck me in my heart as a prayer, and so it's been a blessing in the times that I've been allowed to share it. It's in your hymnal, number 569, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. <clears throat> Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in sweet contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face, heal my wounded broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. 
Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Who have I on earth beside thee? Who in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I don't know how to get it on the screen, so you may have to come up. Thank you. That was a very moving song. Thank God that the door of mercy is still open. God is a merciful God. I thank God he's a just and a holy God as well, because he's in the process of eradicating sin forever. He wants us to keep that in mind, especially when life is difficult and challenging. We want quick fixes, right, our fallen humanity. But God is asking for us to trust him uh, with all of our heart, all of our heart. Well, I have some thoughts I want to share with you today. Thank you. Praise the Lord. You got it up on the screen. Thank you so much, James. Uh, I met James and... 2004 in Rutland, Vermont, and he was so gracious to uh, uh, <clears throat> very uh, feeble preacher who needed a lot of help, and I, I am indebted in my heart ever since then. Thank you. God bless you. It's interesting how God puts people together. Well, I have a lot to cover today, and certainly... Uh, with this being the first official day that, um, you know, in June that uh, our governor has freely thrown the, the doors of the church open for gatherings up to 50, we're, we're, we're expecting and longing for some very uh, deep direction from God. We, we really need that. Uh, this is not an ordinary time, and I hope and pray that all of us have let go of our desire for things to get back to normal. God's trying to let us let go of that desire. Because Jesus is, you know, very eager to pour out the latter rain. And if he's going to pour out the latter rain, things can't go back to normal. Amen? Amen? And so whatever it takes, you know, from the Lord. It's been very humbling for me to learn to be more sensitive and respectful of authority. God is the ultimate authority, but Paul is very clear that in every way possible, we should be respectful towards the earthly authority. And I appreciate the beautiful way, Fred, that very, very sweet and kind and balanced way that you've, uh, you know, encouraged us to be sensitive to that. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of getting sick. We don't have to be afraid of, uh, you know, uh, messing up as far as uh, that. We just can be at peace and be here focused right on God. So I thank the Lord for that. So I'd like to start with a quotation here that was written in 1892. Not 1992, 1892, a long time ago. Uh, the prophet said, the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. That's the angel of Revelation 18, where it says the whole earth. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I didn't even put the, the mic on here. So as we think about the implication of this statement, that the loud cry of the third angel had already begun in 1892. So that was 128 years ago. And it had begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Savior. It was the beginning of the light of Revelation 18. That would fill the whole earth. Now, uh, there's a lot of controversy about how things are playing out and have played out in this movement. Because this is not a normal church, the Advent Church. It's a, it's a divinely inspired movement raised up by God himself in the light of the Judgment Hour message. And there was, the same prophet made a statement in 1901. Now, that was a 13, let's see, no, 11 the statement I just read. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years. Was that prophetic? Yeah. The reason we're here is because of insubordination. That's pretty humbling to really embrace that. If we believe in the gift of prophecy, we, we need to do that, right? Now, there's no kind of, God doesn't condemn us, but he's wanting us to see things from his perspective. As did the children of Israel. But for people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. Wow. So as we study history, it's very important. You know, we're, we're told very clearly what we don't learn from in our historical past we are bound to do what? Repeat, right? And so God wants us to know that we're here because of our insubordination. Now, the people who are alive back in the 1880s and the 1890s have long since gone to their rest. But we as a people have had the Bible and we've had the prophetic messages written down for us, right? That we could study and understand for ourselves. What is on God's heart? And in early writings, there's this beautiful statement, page 63. There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Has that been happening? Absolutely, folks. Absolutely. We see one movement after another, right? One focus after another. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show is past, present, right? Establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to the glorious future. Past, present, future. It's what kind of truth that we need? Present truth. Right? That's what the flock needs now. These I have seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. And of course, in Psalm 77, verse 13, the Bible says, God's way is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Now, I invite you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Exodus, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis 3 and verse 15, when Adam and Eve sinned, God did not ask them why they did what they did. I, I wish I would have learned that earlier as a parent. Because <laughs> I used to ask my kids when they were little why they did the wrong things they did. 
God never does that. He didn't do that to Adam and Eve. He knows why, but we don't know. Unless we're converted, right? And so he didn't ask them why. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to give you another chance. It wouldn't have helped Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they were under the full control of evil. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, when they ate that fruit, were not capable in and of themselves of originating even a right thought. They became, as Paul says in Romans 6, slaves to sin. And so God knew that lecturing them and, you know, shaming them or, or you know, asking them why. Time. So what did God do? Genesis 3.15, he made a promise. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent here. And between your seed and her seed, and it shall crush your head. The seed of the woman would crush Satan's head, and you, the serpent, would crush the woman's seed, Jesus. We know Galatians 3.16, Jesus is the seed of the woman. He would crush his heel. And so God made the first everlasting covenant promise right there in the garden. And God instituted the sanctuary service in simplicity with the sacrificial service, teaching them that it was impossible for them to change themselves, to save themselves, and to reform themselves. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, the, a new principle took over their heart. The Holy Spirit had been united to their human will at their creation. They were sinless. We were created to be temples of God. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6. But the Holy Spirit could not live in them, and they continue to live physically when they sin. And so a new element took control of their will, and that is the element that the perfect universe in heaven itself, that principle of self-righteousness or self-exaltation. I have a better way than God. I can do it better than God. I can be my own God. You know, Satan said, you know what? I want to be on the throne of the universe. I want to be God. And Satan didn't realize it in the beginning, but what would it lead him to do? You know, Jesus said in John 8, verse 44, that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Now, he was losing went down that road, that principle of self-righteousness has in it the profound satanic work of murdering our creator. And that's basically what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He says, all of us have crucified the Son of God. It was our sins that crushed out the life of Christ. And so in the sanctuary service, we see God's method of saving slaves of sin. We see it. We understand it if we're willing. And so we're going to do a quick study here through the first two in that work. In the courtyard was the work of sacrifice. And in that work of the courtyard, in that work of sacrifice, God was teaching us that a substitute needed to come to be a dwelling place for God. You see, it wasn't enough for God just to provide forgiveness. That's essential. But the real key was reconnecting slaves of sin with God. Because if Adam and Eve had not been reconnected to God, they could have never been at peace with God's sovereignty. They never could have. And so that sacrifice, that lamb had to be what? Perfect. We often don't think about the lamb before it was sacrificed. 
And so Jesus became weak as us, helpless as us. He was tempted in all points like as us. And so in the life of Jesus, weak and helpless as us, he kept his human will surrendered to his Father's will. He was the reconnection of every human being with God, Jesus. And then he went to the cross. And so every time Jesus was tempted to turn away from the Father's will, he yielded his human will and put to death in our humanity, the humanity that he took, put to death the power of Satan. He was crushing Satan's head in his life and in his death and in his resurrection because the head of Satan that God said he would crush is that principle of self-righteousness. That's essential. And in 1 John 3 and verse 8, we recognize that Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And where's the most important place for Jesus to destroy the works of the devil? In human hearts. If God can't destroy the works of the devil in human hearts, then Satan is one and God is in feeble and weak. But thank God Jesus was victorious. Hallelujah. And so he was on that cross. He was praying. You know, the verb tense in the Greek is the continuous, Father, forgive them. He was praying for you. He was praying for me. Even though he was fully human, he was still fully divine. And he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he saw you. He made, when he made that decision to drink that cup, he didn't do it just generically. He saw you. He saw me. He saw every human being. When he was on that cross, he was praying for you and for me. The priests, they were surrounding him, right? And what were they doing? They were mocking him, but they were challenging him because Satan was behind those priests. And they were saying, if you're the Son of God, come down off of that cross. But Jesus knew the only way to save you and I was to take our guilt and our shame and the root of and put it to death on that cross. And so he refused to come down. And the last words that he said, remember, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend. My spirit. He died in faith, even though he experienced eternal death in our humanity. And so as he was there and he said, it is finished, his work of sacrifice and reconciler was finished. Praise the Lord. It was finished for the whole human race. That's why the whole today that the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, literally in the literal city of Jerusalem over there in the Middle East, and that sacrifice will be offered as repulsive to God. There can never be any other sacrifice than the sacrifice of Christ Amen. that is efficient and sufficient and all-encompassing. Praise the Lord. Amen. But you know, thank the Lord, Jesus didn't say, he didn't stay in that, in that grave. And so his work in the outer court as sacrifice was finished at the cross. But he was raised on the third day, praise the Lord. And when he was raised, he was raised to begin a new work in the temple of God in heaven. A new work, a very powerful work, and that is the work of... Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Wow. 1 John 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the righteous. There's something in his intercession that is just as essential as his death on the cross. Now, unfortunately, the masses in Christianity don't understand much about the intercession and the power of the intercession of Jesus. 
Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. By the way, what throne is Jesus sitting on since he ascended to heaven? The throne of grace. It brings that out in Hebrews chapter 4. He's not going to sit on his throne of glory until after his intercession is finished. He's a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So he ascended to begin that work of intercession. Hebrews 9 verse 1, Then truly the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, the seven branch candlestick, the table, and the showbread. The table there is referring to the altar of incense, which is called the sanctuary. And so when Jesus went to heaven, he went right there into the presence of God. There, we see him in Revelation chapter 1, there walking up and down in the midst of the candlesticks. Now in the holy place, there were three articles of furniture. There was the seven branch candlestick. Now what did Jesus say about himself, about light? Do you remember? He said, John 8 and John chapter 12, he is the light of the world. But then he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he said, someone else is the light of the world. You are the light of the world. So what is it? What Jesus is teaching us is that through his intercession, we can have God living in us once again. We have no light in and of ourselves. We, we, it's impossible for us to have any spiritual light in and of ourselves. But through his intercession, now God once again can live in fallen humanity. And God can live in us. It's his light. And in John chapter 6, Jesus said he is the living bread that came down from heaven. He said unless we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we have no life in us. Us. And through his intercession, as we study his word, the very thoughts and attitudes of God Almighty can once again be in fallen human beings. Praise the Lord. Now, you could have forgiven me a gazillion times. I mean, you couldn't have, but God could have. But unless God came to live inside of me, I was a slave to sin. I would have been dead long ago, destroyed myself through the, the, the mess of humanity that I am apart from God. And so his intercession is what actually brings the very life of God in us. And without that, our dear sister Ellen said in Desire of Ages chapter 73, without that, his sacrifice would have been of no avail. The sa his sacrifice is the foundation. His intercession is what he transforms his people. Very, very important. There is so much power in the intercession of Jesus. But the devil viciously hates his death and what it accomplished and his intercession and what it can accomplish. And so during the dark ages, what happened in the Christian church? The very principles of Christ's sacrifice and his death were set aside and a counterfeit system was put in its place. Now, some people say, well, you know, I understand, you know, that Jesus forgives us. I don't have to go to a human priest. But in most people in Protestantism, their concept of forgiveness is very similar to what is in the Roman church. And that is that there's no power to stop sinning. You're just going to continue to fail. Just do the best you can. And someday Jesus is going to come. That's not the teaching of Scripture, folks. Our intercessor is mighty and powerful, and there is nothing that is impossible for God to do in a human heart, no matter how messed up our genes are, and no matter how many bad habits we may have accumulated before we came to know the love of God. God is powerful. Amen. He's powerful. We may not understand 
how to experience that power, but woe be to anyone who claims to believe in Jesus and the three angels' messages that would shed doubt on the power of God to give his people victory. Very, very, very important. And so we see Jesus at his ascension walking up and down in the midst of the candlesticks in heaven. But you know, his intercession is not going to last forever. Not because God is going to say someday, you know what, I've had it with those people. I'm not going to save any more of them. No, his intercession is not going to last forever because the time is coming when it will no longer be needed. You know, there are many people that are afraid of living in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. We don't have to be afraid of that at all. If we are willing to be humble and enter into the heart of Christ's intercession now, that's good news because Jesus is going to so any heart that's open on this earth that they will be sealed and their sins will be blotted out. Amen. And everyone else who resists that intercession of Christ, who's alive, intercession will no longer be needed for them because they will have committed the unpardonable sin. There's nothing God can do to reach them. Their hearts are fully hardened. And so in the intercession of Jesus, there is power that we can experience the crucifixion of what the cross has done itself, and we can experience the very life of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, now we're going to the final phase. That's the focus of our study today, Hebrews 9, verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Adam's Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Three things in that ark, not one. There's three things in that ark. And all three of them are very important for us in these last days. The tables of the covenant, Ten Commandments, the golden pot that had manna, very important. You know, it's very fascinating as you study how God took care of his prophet Elijah you know, during the great apostasy, God fed Elijah, and it's very, very clear from the Bible that the ravens brought him bread and flesh. But in Isaiah chapter 33, when God took care of his people at the end of time, just before Jesus comes, he says that our bread and our water will be sure. The golden pot that had manna, very important there, and Aaron's rod and butter. Those are not the main focus of our study here. And over at the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, one of those cherubims used to be Lucifer. But he rejected his great privilege before God. He rejected that great privilege. And, and so the mercy seat over the ark is such a beautiful picture of the true character of God. Mercy and justice perfectly blended in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Very, very, very powerful and important. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, always accomplishing the service of God. And so we recognize when we are forgiven today, that our sins are forgiven and the record of that forgiveness is transferred right there into heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. People may condemn you and condemn me for our past sins, but God wants us to know there's a record in heaven of that forgiveness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We need to focus on what God thinks of us, right? But that record is still there. We still sometimes remember... Right? We still sometimes remember the horrible things that we've done. You know, I've been going through a deeper repentance in my experience. You know, that's God's desire. That's an ongoing work. And it's been very shocking to me as God has been bringing more vividly and, and more profoundly the effect of my past upon the people that I have hurt. 
Now, it's a very important to understand. In the repentance that God brings, there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. Romans 8, 1. Where does condemnation come from? From the devil. But the repentance that God is working in every heart that's willing is very, very devastating to our human psyche. It helps us to get a deeper and deeper glimpse of how bad sin is. You know, folks, we do not sin because we're weak. We sin because we really don't believe how bad sin is, and we really don't understand how to stay connected to God moment by moment. You know what Jesus said in, in John chapter 15? He said that he is the vine and we are the branches, and he is calling us to do what? Abide in him. Because as we learn to abide in him, which is simply keeping our human will surrendered to God, the Holy Spirit lives in us, right? And so God is doing this work. He's in the Holy of Holies now. He's finishing his work of intercession, and he's doing a work of blotting out of sin. Hebrews 9.23, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Acts 17, 31, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. So his final work as priest is a work of judgment. Now, there's been a lot of controversy in the Christian world about judgment, and there's been a lot of controversy in the Adventist church about judgment. Judge, to me, the, the work of Christ in, in, in judgment is the most incredible picture, if we understand it biblically, into the love and the mercy and the great character of God. It is just because in the work of judgment, we get deeper, more vivid, more powerful revelations of his sacrifice and his incredible work as intercessor and his work in eradicating sin. There's more life flowing from the, from the Holy of Holies upon this universe through the intercession of Jesus. It's a powerful work that Jesus is doing. And we recognize that biblically God wanted us to know when that final work would begin. He wanted us to know there's certain things that God definitely wanted his people to know. Dana, God wanted his people to know when Messiah would be anointed. God wanted his people to know. He foretold after 69 weeks, Messiah would be anointed. He wanted his people to know. And he wanted his people to know the last week, after three and a half years, he wanted his people to know that Messiah would be cut off. You know, through Daniel 9, God's people had the privilege to know not only the year of Christ's death, but they, they could know biblically the very... He was the Passover lamb. They could have known that. And he wanted them to know the very hour. It was the, the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. There's certain things that God wants his people to know because it's important for us. Bedrock, foundational, spiritual issues to build on. Hey. Folks, this is another one. And by the way, <clears throat> there has been more condemnation of Adventists over this issue than any other thing that we believe over our belief in the judgment. More misrepresentation, and I'm not saying we've always had it correct, right? We, God's trying to help us understand this thing from his perspective. We have had a tendency in the past to be very legalistic about understanding judgment. But God is wanting us to see this is a huge issue, praise the Lord. After 2,300 days, then the sanctuary. In the King James, it says, cleanse other translations will be vindicated. 
God's way is in the sanctuary. Who really has been slandered and misrepresented in this universe? It's been God Almighty. Sometimes we get upset when people misrepresent us, but God is being vindicated in this cosmic judgment in a way that all those who are saved will never, ever, ever question his authority forever. You know, Revelation twice says that God rules with a rod of iron. That's true. But God rules with a rod of iron through love. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He's the creator. He knows everything. He knows what will, will bring true happiness. And all this is coming out in this incredible judgment. And so we recognize God has led us down to this time. And by the way, in Revelation chapter 10, and the finishing of the mystery of God, it's going to happen just as the seventh angel begins the sound. Okay, this finishing of the mystery of God in Revelation 10 and the cleansing of the sanctuary in, Reve in Daniel chapter 8 is the same exact experience and event. And so we've been living in God's judgment hour. Now in Daniel chapter 7, we know as God through Daniel showed the ancient of days, right, placing his thrones and who was gathered around there. The, the, the son of man was brought near to the ancient of days, Daniel 7, right? But who is all gathered around? The angels. All of the cosmic universe is dialed in. They want to understand more clearly and more powerfully. But this is 1844. It's a long time ago. And I'll tell you what, folks. The cosmic universe can understand things pretty readily and pretty clearly. There's a work in this judgment that God has given the privilege to those of us who are alive as a demonstration. So everybody who's living on planet Earth can make an intelligent decision whether they want to be all in for God or not. Very, very important as we think about this. So I want to read this. And I, I was so thrilled. I was talking to Pastor Don on the phone a few days ago, and he said that you guys have been studying the great controversy. That's so awesome. I'll tell you what, that, that, that book is so profound. You know, I, have a, I, I mentioned in Sabbath school, I have a, a neighbor who, who says he doesn't even believe in God. And he's reading a great controversy right now, and he's not turned off by it. He's looking at Bible verses. I'll tell you, that book was inspired by God. And by the way, as Ellen was given those visions, Satan, I think it was twice, tried to kill her. The messages are so important. Well, anyway, this is the, uh, a statement here. The subject of the sanctuary in the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. Clearly understood. Not, not an imbalance. Not in half, half, you know, just half of what it is. Clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge of themselves, of the position and work of their great high priest. Position and work. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. That's a power. God has called us, those of us alive. You know, Queen Esther, remember what Mordecai said to her? You have been called to the kingdom of what? For such a time as this. We've been called. God's eternal purpose for such a time as this. This is our privilege. And God says if we don't understand clearly his work, it will be impossible for us to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. That is so beautiful. Pretty simple. Pretty clear, right? And so God is wanting to give us a deeper understanding of this great work. Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy the minds that they may not dwell upon the very work upon which we ought to be best acquainted. We, according to God, according to the prophet, inspired by God, the best thing that we would understand in the whole world of all knowledge is the work of Jesus as he's finishing the mystery of God. Wow. I want to understand. I don't know about you, but I want to understand that more and more deeply. It says, 
the arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice. Folks, we never have any hope and never have any merit outside of the righteousness of Christ. There is nothing that you and I can do to add to the incredible righteousness that he has given to us and the death that he died. We can never add to that. And so seeing he hates these great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice and an all powerful mediator. He knows that with him, everything depends upon diverting minds from Jesus and his truth. You know, I was driving here today, and I saw, I don't know, it was probably half a dozen people outside walking. And if I don't have a perfect memory, but I believe that every single one of them had a handheld device now, it's not wrong to use our handheld device. Don't get me wrong. But I believe that we have to guard our time that we spend. Because remember, God has much more important things to teach his people. We have to ask God for wisdom, how we use technology. Very important. And it's not wrong to have those. It's not wrong to take advantage of those things. But I can see it. I was thinking on my way over. These people, they were outside. It's a beautiful morning, right? And they were in natural settings. And I was thinking, oh, God, how much harder is it now for us as human beings to hear you speaking to us with our minds engrossed with these things? And how much more do we need to hear the voice of God now than ever before? So we're going to go into the Holy of Holies here. In Revelation chapter 11, you know, in vision, God gave John this 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 picture into the throne room of God. He's talking about the time of the dead that they should uh, be judged and he would give reward to his servants, the saints. And then he said this in verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. And so the temple of God opened for anyone who's willing right now. Folks, this is where God is calling us to direct our attention. The Holy of Holies and where Jesus is now and what he is there for and what he's accomplishing. Now, unfortunately, the judgment more about us than about God. We've struggled with security in this movement, unfortunately, so much. Because our human tendency is, is that, you know, we're the center of the universe. We don't consciously think that, but that's our human tendency. I want to make sure I get to heaven. Now, is it wrong to want to be in heaven? No, that's an awesome thing, and only God can put that in our hearts, right? right. But you know, God owes it to the universe never to allow evil again. God, you know, God's got to get it right this time. He's never done anything wrong, but this is the first time that evil's ever come into the universe, right? God's got to get it right. He, he owes it to the universe. He knew that everyone needed, and the whole universe needed time to develop and understand for themselves who they would serve, who they would give their undivided divided loyalty to. But folks, the, the judgment is not about us. You know, God wants you in heaven more than you want to be there. Would you want God to take you to heaven if you'd be miserable there for the rest of eternity? Would you? No, I would. I mean, I was smart enough to figure that out. Before I was born again, my mom became a Christian when I was seven years old. And before I was born again, she started taking me to church. I hated being in church. I'm not proud of that. I'm ashamed of that. I wish my heart would have been open. I hated to be in church. I hated reading the Bible. It was the most boring thing in the world because I was unconverted. I was a lost soul. I wasn't open. And if you would have taken me to heaven in that condition without a surrendered heart, it would have been torture for me. God is... His heart and the safety of the universe, the safety of everyone around us, right? It's not... Just about, I mean, again, God's not trying to keep anyone out of heaven. Jesus died for everyone. But in this judgment, he's got a great work to do. And so in Leviticus, is on the cleansing of the sanctuary. And he says there a number of things about this work. 
He says that we would afflict our souls and do no work, okay? And the priest was going to make an atonement and cleanse you. Jesus is blotting out the sin of his people that would never, ever be remembered again. Is that attractive to you? Isn't that awesome? Man, I tell you, that's so That's part of what he's doing, trying to blot out that sin. But we have a part in cooperation with what Jesus is doing. Very important, and we're going to study that for the rest of our time. So let's go ahead and turn to Leviticus 23 now. And I'd like for us to see here, this Leviticus 23 is all about the different ceremonial Sabbath days. It starts out with the Passover and the, the, uh, the wave sheaf, the unleavened bread. And uh, it, goes down to, it goes through the spring feast, and then it goes into the fall feast. Leviticus 23, and we're going to look at the Day of Atonement here, beginning in verse 23. Leviticus 23, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 27. Leviticus 23, verse 27. Also in the tenth day, there shall be a day of atonement. We know the Day of Atonement at one meant, right? Perfect harmony. It shall be, there's four things that God called on his people. There shall be an holy convocation unto you. Now, what is the devil trying to do? He's trying to divert our minds from the very work and experience that Jesus is accomplishing, right? So what's with this holy convocation? We're not going to have time to go into as much detail as I would like. But what's with this holy convocation? Back in the literal Day of Atonement, the, the typical Day of Atonement, every family in Israel were required to stand in the doorway of their tent and focus their undivided attention on the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, where the high priest was doing his work of atonement, right? They were not rubbing shoulders because there was a lot of them. But it was a holy convocation. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, remember what Paul said. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But then what is he going to say? As you see the day approaching. He wasn't talking about the second coming. He was talking about the cosmic judgment. In other words, it's more important now to spend time together than it's ever been. We're God's people. We claim to be God's people. Now, God has his sheep everywhere. God, God has people that have the Holy Spirit. I believe this with all my heart, according to Romans chapter 2, that God has people in Hinduism. There's some of those people that have the Holy Spirit. They're living up to all the light they have. I believe that God has some atheists. Maybe my neighbor's one of them. I don't know. But God is some atheists who, when they say they reject God, they're not rejecting the true God. They're rejecting the wrong pictures of God that they've seen, right, in the Christian church. God has people everywhere, right? But he's calling us to a holy convocation. That's why the devil works so hard to keep us from spending time together. Folks, if there's ever been a time that we need to hear each other, it's now. None of us are safe left all by ourselves. None of us. That's why this whole convocation is so important. We need to be sharing, studying the word, sharing, giving feedback, listening, being open, uh, asking God, God, I want to understand more clearly. Because sometimes God doesn't send an angel directly to us to show us something in the Bible. Sometimes God uses a brother or sister in the church to help us see something more clearly. It's still God who's the source, but God is wanting us to humble our hearts and receive Whatever he has. You know, as, as our dear sister Ellen was sitting at the General Conference in 1888, and she was listening to Dr. Wagner present the message of Christ our righteousness, she could hardly sit still. She said, every fiber of my being said amen. She said, I want to receive every ray of light, no matter what humble instrument God may, may bring it through. There was a prophet of God who thought like that. God is trying to give us that heart. 
Please, I want to press together. I want to lean in. Not just to be together physically, but our whole hearts are together. Amen. Our whole hearts. A holy convocation. Holy convocation. That doesn't mean we have to be together. You know, just physically we can do it like you've been doing it, like we've been doing it over in Conway where, where my wife and I go to church on Zoom. But we need, God's always the source, but we need to be together. Holy convocation. By the way, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, Jesus says, you know, if you're going on your way to the temple and you remember that somebody has something against you, remember what Jesus said? Leave your gift and go to that person and make sure at least you've done what you could. We can't change anyone else. It's not our job to convince someone else that they ought to straighten out. That's not our job. Our job is to do everything in our power to be humble and sensitive if there's any way that we've hurt someone. This holy convocation, it's a big deal. It's, it was for the Day of Atonement. We're in that time. We desperately need this experience. But he doesn't stop there. And the next point he says, and you shall afflict your souls. Now this is a very uh, profound uh, truth here. The word afflict, you look it up in the, in the concordance, in the strongest concordance in the Hebrew, it means to humble and to subdue by force. I'll tell you what I believe it means. We're coming back to chapter uh, 4, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And no, notice what it says here in regard to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 4, 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. You know what Paul said in Galatians 2, 20? He said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. You remember what Jesus said? There was one thing Jesus said that was essential to be a disciple. And he said it over and over again. What did Jesus say to people if they were going to be his disciple? Take up your cross. Follow me. So what's this cross thing all about? Was there something in the cross of Christ that is absolutely essential for us? According to the Bible here, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10, he says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. You know, when Jesus died on that cross, folks, he put to death the old us. That's what Paul based the gospel on, that the old man was crucified with Christ, right? Hebrews 2, 9, it says that he tasted death for every one of his children, Okay? And in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, he brings out there that when one died for all, then we're all dead. The crucifixion that Jesus took, that cross that Jesus died on was our cross, not his cross. You remember who that cross literally was built for that Jesus died on? Bar what does Barabbas' name mean? Son of Papa, son of of the Father. That was our cross. That's what we deserve, eternal death. Because it wasn't the nails and it wasn't the thorns that killed Jesus, his humanity. It was our guilt and our shame. And the Lord made him, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Lord made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He bore not only the guilt and shame, praise of all sin, that sinful self. He put it to death 2,000 years ago. Praise the Lord! Because I don't know about you, but my humanity is so rotten, unless I embrace that crucifixion of the old Rick, it's impossible for me to be a kind person. It's in spiritual things. So on the Day of Atonement, when, when God said to afflict your souls, that was a type of us learning to embrace and, and we see it in verse 10, to learn by faith to bear about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. And what does that open the door for? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our flesh. Verse 11, he says the same thing. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. You know, there's many times that God does not sympathize with us. 
He has, always has compassion on us. I'll give you an example. I've had so many times when I've complained to God, and I've given God a hard time. God, why do I have to go through this? Thankfully, I'm overcoming that through his mercy and grace, right? But as a young Christian, man, I didn't get I, so much I didn't get. I knew that God, God had forgiven my sins, praise the Lord, but it was so much I didn't get. And I remember uh, many, many years ago as a pastor, I was complaining, God, why do I have to be an Adventist pastor? What a sick thing for someone like me to say to God, Right? It's, it's one of the greatest privileges that anyone could ever have. Amen. I was feeling sorry for myself. I was visiting in someone's home, and they were saying how bad the church was, and so-and-so was this way, and so-and-so was that way, and I'm feeling sorry for myself. You know, God did not sympathize with me. He rebuked me. He said, Rick, who do you think you are? I've given you this incredible privilege of getting paid to share the word of God and the three angels' messages and the beautiful truths of God's character, and you're complaining? You know what God did for me right then? He's done it for me thousands and thousands of times. Verse 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 11, For we which live are always delivered unto death. God said, Rick, right now what you need is crucifixion, experientially. What you need is to have that 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 self-centered way of thinking put to death right now in your experience. Always bearing about in the body. the die. So that, the life of Jesus. You see, God has called us to take up our cross daily. Now in the Day of Atonement, he's trying to teach us moment by moment to bear about in our body that the powerful supernatural work of God putting to death every prompting of the me, myself, and I attitude. Flicked our souls. Back Leviticus chapter 23. Very, very practical things that God is calling us to do to cooperate with him as he's there in the Holy of Holies. So, there's a holy convocation and to afflict our soul, right? And in verse 27, we're reading on, and then the people were to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You know, in Malachi chapter 3, it talks about, you know, the, the, the priest. Let's turn there. I, I know some of you, <clears throat> there's not many that have to endure a long sermon here. Uh, people at home, they can switch this off. And you guys can leave if you want. But, I, you know, the Lord has laid some things on my heart. I just want to share them with you. Let's turn to Malachi, just before Matthew, about this offering made by fire unto the Lord. This is so important. Malachi chapter 3, and it talks about God. We know is Jesus. Okay, Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. When did Jesus suddenly come to his temple? 1844, right? No one was looking for him there. The messenger of the covenant, that's Jesus. By the way, the, the beginning messenger in this passage was John the Baptist, but he goes on to talk about the messenger of the covenant, that's Jesus. Verse 2, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Folks, the offering made by fire that God expects his people to bring on the real day of atonement, the real time of judgment, is a heart that's been fully purified through the righteousness of Christ. Wow. What a privilege God has given to us. What an honor God has bestowed upon us that he would give us his privilege. You know, in, in gold, some of you have probably done the research, you know, in order for gold to be purified, you've got to bring it up to a temperature of about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, just under 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's to get every last impurity. In other words, if you're going through, if you've been going through some very trying experiences where God is showing you that, you know what, all these people around you that maybe are difficult, 
they're really not the problem. If you're going through this experience where you're beginning to realize, you know what, God, my heart is the one that's in need. It's my heart that you're asking me to surrender and be changed by the power of your intercession. If you're going through that, then you're in the process of bringing to God this offering made by fire. Very, very important that God is trying to help us to experience this. This crucifixion of that principle of self-righteousness is the most painful thing that we will ever experience. But every time we're willing to embrace the cross experientially, there's a deeper peace, a deeper joy, there's more of the, the just the thoughts and attitudes of God. It's a progressive work, but it's a very supernatural and powerful work that God is doing. And then the final thing he says there, in Leviticus 23, it was to do no work. Now, we're going to go over to Hebrews just now. Hebrews chapter 4. And I'd like for us to notice here what that means in our modern day time. Do no work. Now, what did God clearly say in Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23? Those who didn't afflict their soul and those who didn't do any work, those who did work, what did God say would happen to them on the, on the, the physical day of atonement? They'd be cut off. Now, this is very important. God's not hard-nosed, folks. He's not hard-nosed. He's a merciful God. He wants everyone in heaven more than they want to be there. But you and I were not born back in AD 31. We were not born back in 1806. We've been privileged to be alive during the final work of Christ's intercession. That means that we have the greatest privileges that have been given to anyone who's ever lived, live, but it also means that we have the greatest responsibilities. So God says those who refuse, intelligently refuse, to embrace this deep work in the final work of Christ's intercession, God says what's going to happen to them? They're going to be cut off. Now, somebody might be thinking, man, Rick, I just wish I didn't know this, or I just, I just wish I wasn't alive right now. You know, God knows that those who truly love him, and maybe that, that they're, they're just by, for whatever circumstances in their life, maybe can't grasp or experience, that doesn't mean they're not going to be in the, in the kingdom of heaven. But God in his mercy may lay them to rest so they don't have to go through that great time. But God is longing God is longing for human beings, men and women, and young people that are willing to get heart to heart with him during this time. Amen. He's longing for that. He's longing for that. So Hebrews chapter 4, and we, we know this passage in chapter 3, he's talking about what, the reason Israel didn't enter in, right? And why didn't Israel enter into the promised land uh, back after they came out of Egypt? Why didn't they enter in? Unbelief, right? There's, a, by the way, there's only two attitudes: unbelief or faith. There's, there's, there's no other, there's no gray area. Unbelief or faith, right? That's, that's all there is. And so God begins here to show us how to have true faith. Okay, verse uh, one, chapter Hebrews four, verse one. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Lots of promises, over three thousand. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So faith enables us to do Christ's rest. Right? Notice what it says. We don't have time to go into this as much as I'd like. Look at verse 9. Therefore, there remains a rest, a sabbatismos in the Greek, to the people of God. For he or she that has entered into his rest has also ceased from their own works as God did from his. Wow. So in the Day of Atonement, the real Day of Atonement, the real time of judgment, God is calling us to learn by his intercession, by his grace and his motivating love to abide in Jesus constantly. 
Now, have there ever been individuals who learned to do that? Yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. Enoch was one. He walked with God for 300 years. And he was so immersed in God and God in him that God took him right to heaven. Are we not preparing for translation? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, some people say, oh, that's overwhelming. I don't see how it's possible. The things that are impossible with us are possible with God. And God wants us to see day by day. He's our teacher. He can work and help us to grow in this work. I'll tell you what, we're living in the, in the real time of judgment. We don't have time for a couple other things, but I want to finish up with this statement. This is from the, the, the what's that paraphrase? The Message Bible. This. No, I was talking about Jacob. Pure gold put in the fire comes out of it pu proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. This was not a Seventh-day Adventist who wrote this paraphrase. You never saw him, yet you love him. You still don't see him, yet trust him. With laughter and singing, because you have kept on believing, you'll get what you're looking forward to, total salvation. The prophets who told us this was coming, asked a lot of questions about this gift of life God was preparing. The Messiah's spirit let them in on some of it that the Messiah would experience suffering, followed by glory. They clamored to know who and when, and all they were told was that they were serving you, you who by orders from heaven have now heard the Holy Spirit, the message of those prophecies fulfilled. Do you angels would have given anything to be in on this. I hope and pray that somehow in a tiny bit more way today we realize how fortunate we are that God has given us these precious truths. They need much more study. We need to dig in and study God's word, searching like never before. God has called us. We don't have to be afraid. We're fully accepted through the righteousness of Christ. This isn't about being good enough, folks. This is about entering into the depth of the heart of Jesus Christ. God the Father, all of heaven, is cheering his people on in these last days. And the people around us, the people around us, do they not need a vivid revelation of the true character of God? Reasoning with people today is becoming more and more difficult because the masses are so emotionally damaged, it's hard for them to even comprehend spiritual words. But they can, if their hearts are open, behold the love of God in you. Paul says that you, any believer, myself, are God's letter, known and read of all men. As we close today, God is inviting us to make a decision of absolute, unreserved surrender to him as our Lord and our intercessor and our Savior. That we don't say, well, you know what, God, I, I want to be in heaven, but you know, I'm struggling. Now. God is asking you to say, you know what, God, I'm struggling, but take all of my heart, all of my heart. If that's your decision, I invite you, if you're able, to just slip to your knees just now, to say, God, take all of my heart. Work me this week. Help me, Lord, to be humble and open for you to teach me through your experience. Father in heaven, Lord, how many have been able to comfort you, especially since 1844. How many, Lord, have been willing to appreciate 
the pain and heartache in your heart. That continual unbelief brings. Oh Lord, today we're thankful that you have embraced us 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ and given us a full and complete salvation. And Jesus, we thank you that you're a powerful mediator, a powerful intercessor, and that you are eager to train us in how to experience holy convocation by faith and how to bear about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus by faith and how to present an offering made by fire by faith and how to cease from our own works by faith. Oh, Lord, it's not complicated. Oh, how our heart struggles at times with absolute unreserved surrender. Lord, you'll never manipulate us. We thank you for that. You'll never pressure or force us, and we thank you for that. But Lord, you hold out your, your arms, your heart. You've told us it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour studying the life of Jesus, especially the closing scenes as we near long to reveal to us how much sin has hurt you and continues to hurt you, that we will grow to loathe it and despise it and hate it just like you do. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us these last three months where Many, most of us, at least in this area, as your people, had not been viciously attacked. Lord, that day is coming. We don't have to be afraid. As long as we're surrendering to you one day at a time, you'll give us the strength and courage we need. But Lord, you never, ever want us to go back to the way things were before. You're longing that our heart would just be open and reaching out to you like never before in our lives. Not just individually, Lord, but also as churches, as bodies of believers that we would be pressing together. And Jesus, we thank you that when Daniel 12, verse that you stand up that you're going to be standing for your people. Probation will close. The door of mercy will be closed. But you'll be standing for your people. And the latter rain will be falling. And every heart that's willing will be saved. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We give you all the honor. For anything good in our life, we know it couldn't come from us. A good thought, that can only come from you. A kind gesture, it can only come from you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor for anything that is good. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Stephen's going to be at the back door escorting... Folks out from the rear of the church, is that correct? All right.